Okay, <clears throat> so back to kind of part two of this story where we're looking at some artists who are more closely associated with the United States for a minute and then I'm bringing in some other kind of classical ideas that are at work here. Uh, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. These aren't the major players, frankly. Um, this is a work by John Trumbull. It's George Washington before the Battle of Trenton. Um, John Trumbull is a kind of interesting story to me. Uh, he was the, the son of a very prominent um, man in Connecticut who went on to be the governor of Connecticut, came from a, a very cultured household. Um, he was slated to be kind of the next in the line of his father's ascendancy in political power, uh, but he didn't want to do it. And it, it kind of made his father mad, which is pretty common uh, at the time. Artists, you know, artistry wasn't something that if you came from the gentlemanly class or that you had any kind of privilege whatsoever, was something you're really supposed to turn towards, especially if you're an American. His father and, and your text has some pretty good quotes about this, just completely belittles it, right? He says, I don't know why he went to do this anyway. It, it, the story is that John Trumbull, when he was a kid, actually had an accident that um, where he lost the, the use of one of his eyes. So how are you going to be an artist that when his father goes on to say, and gentlemen just don't become artists. But he wanted to do it and he stuck to it. And, uh, you know, he did a little bit of training in Pennsylvania and then he goes to study under Benjamin West and kind of goes back and forth between the United States and Great Britain. As a matter of fact, there's a whole host of things going on in the story behind the scenes where he's accused of treason when he's in Great Britain for being too American and his sympathies and these, these types of concerns actually show up in his art. But like most, of course, he, uh, and again, our big narrative is here are a number of artists who are really interested in kind of trying to document and heroize the early founding of the United States um, through their paintings. They think of these paintings as contributing to history. This, this is kind of like showing you the greatness of what will become the United States. And they're, they're really committed to that. However, as I hope I've been pointing out, you know, a lot of people in the United States don't think that classical aesthetics is really the way to go about it. So it doesn't really take hold. We see again here, George Washington kind of almost based upon a little bit better version of the Charles Wilson Peel picture um, before this, this famous battle, um, uh, you know, getting ready, so to speak, um, getting ready to take his horse and lead his people off into battle. Um, no reason to go into this in any more detail. Uh, John Trumbull, of course, in seeking to document the key moments in American history, will go at all of them. These are fairly small paintings, two by three. He thought that if he created kind of all these key moments, such as this, the signing of the Declaration of Independence as paintings, he could sell them as engravings through what were known as subscriptions. You would buy a subscription to his work that would help fund the next engraving and you get this series over the course of years of uh, kind of fundamental moments of the history of the United States. It didn't work out that way, uh, primarily because the audience in the United States didn't want to buy him. And when he's working in England, what do they want with pictures of, you know, these these upstarts from the revolution? So in this case, again, very classical in its sense, a balanced form of leaders stepping up to sign the Declaration of Independence, or this is the one that I'll spend the most time on with John Trumbull. Uh, this is his famous, uh, the death of General Warren at the Batter of Battle of Bunker's Hill. What I'd like you to be thinking about a little bit here is how this composition is different than the work that he's obviously kind of referring to, The Death of General Wolf by Benjamin West, who is also his teacher. Um, the big difference is that instead of a really solidly balanced composition, in order to give you some sense of movement and dynamism and a battle ensuing, the artist has set everything up on a diagonal axis as if it's sweeping from the harbor off in the far right following that sword of uh, uh, the leader down in the, the far corner up to the high 
um, left hand side. And when you set things on diagonals, it's going to add a lot more movement and what we call dynamism, right? Movement in the picture itself that's to mimic a battle scene. But when we get over here to the death of General Montgomery, um, you see uh, a more kind of pyramidal form. Look at how he's built up all of these light forms to look like a big kind of triangle here. He's also, of course, mimicked the Pieta gesture of Benjamin West. The figure looks like, you know, Christ dying uh, in the last moment. Uh, to make that allusion to sacrifice. And then finally, and your text does a really good job pointing this out, because he is trying to, let's say, waffle back and forth between appealing to an English audience, and he, at this point he's already been accused of uh, treason, he's been put in jail, he actually got shipped back to the United States for a while, as well as a both an American and a British audience, what he's showing you here is a moment in which one of the leaders was trying to finish off Montgomery by stabbing him with his bayonet and another leader from Great Britain is stopping him. So there's this kind of, there's two moral lessons here. One is sacrificing for one's cause and the other one is showing mercy for uh, the sacrifice of a great man. Or another tremble work. The resignation of General Washington, uh, December 1783. This is him turning over his command of the Continental Armies in uh, about six years in 1789, if I remember correctly, he will be elected the first president of the United States. And you can probably see how this is very classical, but I'll take you through some key parts of it. You've got, a, obviously it starts with a, a very important story or subject um, you know, this, this moment of American history, it's uh, got a big moral lesson to you, right? Don't aspire to power. It's, um, this is something that leaders of European countries in the past, tyrants had done. Here's a man who doesn't want that military power. He'd rather give it up and go back to the simple life. Um, it uses perfect form. He's not great at proportionality, but he's trying to get that perfect proportionality of a canon of proportions. He's got a clear focal point in the center. All of the architecture is rendered in linear one point perspective. If you put a ruler up along this line of uh, the pediment here and ran it down, it would end up at a vanishing point on George Washington, right? Same thing over here, follow my cursor, put a ruler here, it's gonna end up right there. Same thing with all of these lines. They're all receding back to that vanishing point that happens to be the focal point of the picture. George Washington right in the center, not overlapped, all eyes on him. So there's an implied lines pointing him out and on and on and on. Another artist who did the same thing, he, he studied in the United States for a bit or colonial America. Then he goes to England to study under Benjamin West for a while. He learns classical ideas and then he tries to import those classical ideas to the Americas is Samuel Morse. You might know that name because Samuel Morse, after he kind of fails as an artist, and he didn't really fail, just no one supporting him, uh, goes on to, for instance, import photography to the United States. He's one of the first entrepreneurs with that and to develop the Morse code that we use even today. He's the guy who invented that and the telegraph. In any case, he goes to Europe, he does this studying, he comes back and he gets Congress to agree to buy a series of works that are on um, kind of the workings of government, including this famous work called the House of Representatives. So you're looking at the rotunda in the House of Representatives here and um, and they started as, this one's actually a big painting, but a lot of these were small paintings that he did that were supposed to be turned into big paintings, but in the end, Congress reneged on its promise to buy these, and so they didn't go anywhere. What he's focused on here is the grand idea. Congress, as your text points out, at this time was a lot of infighting, a lot of people not liking each other, a lot of argumentative things going on. It, it hardly worked as a stately affair. It's, you know, for a while there, um, the Senate anyway was a fairly stately business, but the House of Representatives has always been pretty contentious, but he doesn't show that. He doesn't want to represent Congress that way. Instead, what he shows is Congress during a little bit of a recess, 
where the chandelier has been lit and you see this beautiful kind of um, very stately space uh, that has this kind of grandeur to it, the idea of democracy, um, you know, unfolding very rationally, even though it probably didn't work this way. When he couldn't get the American public to really get on board with classical aesthetics, um, he, as well as a number of other artists, did things like this. A few years ago now, this was um, shown at the Seattle Art Museum. This is his famous painting called The Exhibition Gallery of the Louvre from 1833. For those of you who don't know, the Louvre in Paris is the world's biggest museum. It's kind of the iconic museum in the world centered in France, which was at this time when he painted this, the center of the art world. We've been focusing on England because that's where most of the American artists went, but France was really the biggest game in town. So what he did here is he went to the Grand Gallery, which is the most famous gallery in the Louvre at the time, and he's painted basically a painting full of little miniatures of all the other paintings. And in the center of this, he's got people studying painting or learning painting. And his idea was most Americans don't like classical art or the history of art because they've just never seen it before. But if I create a painting that gives them an introduction to the history of art, maybe they'll grow to love it more and there will be a place in the Americas for classical art and frankly, by extension, art in general, more than just portraiture. Didn't work, of course, but that was his goal. One of the things I like to point out is this is the way that ancient galleries were hung. It's called the salon style hang. It's the same kind of hang that would be done or exhibition that would be done in the Royal Academies. And when you look at all of these famous paintings, notice something. This is 1833. This is Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. It's before the Mona Lisa got famous, which actually didn't quite happen until the beginning of the 19th century when it was stolen by an Italian janitor. And here, it's in the famous gallery, but it's one of many, many paintings, and it's not even given a pride of place at this point in time. Another artist who followed the same trajectory went to Europe to train. In this case, he went to France to train, was John Vanderlyn. John Vanderlyn learned the classical style and sought to do the same thing we've seen already. This is the landing of Columbus from 1737 or so. Um, and so he's taking a key moment of the history of the founding of North America, kind of the precedent for the United States, and he's painting it in a classical style. Grand subject, right? All the figures idealized, clear focal point, foreground, middle ground, background, all of that stuff. He also, um, like many Europeans of the time, tried his hand at a subject that was becoming increasingly popular in Europe at the time, um, the female nude. Now, I need you to know historically that traditionally it's the male nude that is the most exalted artistic form because the male nude uh, was in the image of God. Most Greek sculptures, when they are nude, are males, uh, with few exceptions. During the Renaissance, of course, male nudity was far more prevalent than female nudity and associated with this idea that the ideal male form was a manifestation of the divine on earth. But it didn't take long for artists to figure out that they could use that same kind of criterion or rationale to depict female nudity. Right? So if male nude is a reflection of the divine, then the perfect female nude is also a reflection of the divine. And it, in a way, authorizes the representation of female nudity, by which I mean, we're talking about very Christian cultures, right? And for the most part, their sexual mores are quite conservative. So the idea of representing nudity itself is quite a stretch. And, you know, at various moments in this history, People will speak up against that. But the rationale that the beautiful nude human form is a representation or a reflection of the divine uh, was something that you know a lot of people chose to believe in. And then, of course, it got adapted to the female 
nude. But there's some really different things about the female nude than the male nude historically, and I want to talk about a few of those here. This is John Vanderlyn's uh, Ariadne Asleep on the Island of Naxos. Ariadne uh, comes from Greek mythology. She's the daughter of King Minos. She helps Theseus slay the Minotaur in Greek mythology, who is a half man, half bull who lives under the palace at Canossus. She's kind of the brains behind the operation. She's the one who gives Theseus the thread that he uses to sneak into this maze uh, in order to kill the Minotaur so that he can find his way back out. They supposedly fall in love, or at least she thought they did. They sail back to Athens. He takes her with him. But on the island of Naxos, where they stop, he abandons her. It's kind of a typical guy story, so to speak, if you don't mind me, with some crass humor. You can actually see him creeping off in the morning here on a ship, leaving her asleep. Now, none of that mythology matters at all, except that it authorizes the depiction of this beautiful female body. In other words, if the artist had just called this beautiful female lying on a bed uh, out in nature, no one would have accepted it. But because it comes from Greek mythology, it has that classical rationale, right? It comes from a grand subject, so you can represent it. Now, unlike male nudes who are almost always doing something or the subjects will do something important, in female depictions of the nude body, they're almost always passive. They're almost always like this, lying down with their eyes closed, inviting us to look at them. In fact, more often than not, their eyes are closed, turned away, and we get to look at a body with impunity that otherwise we wouldn't be able to see anywhere else, right? There's not nudity out there in their world the same way there is in our world. So at this time period, this is the one place that you can do this and feel like it's okay to do it because it's classical art. I want to talk about some of the dynamics of this, and I'm not going to go into great detail here. But we will come back to this um, at least once uh, or twice later in the quarter. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this. One of the things that I want to emphasize here is the problematic of representing women passively and with their eyes closed that sets up a, what we call a viewing dynamic, a relationship between us and the viewers and that thing that we're looking at that is oftentimes described as voyeuristic. A voyeuristic viewing dynamic says we as the viewers, whether we be male or female, whether we be heterosexual or homosexual, are set up in a position of visual mastery or power. Like a voyeur, we get to look at something that doesn't get to look at us in return, and it gives us a, a feeling of mastery, right? It's the same feeling that you might get, again, I'm not saying any of you peep through peepholes, but you might get or feel familiar with if you've ever looked through binoculars at someone who's a really long ways away and you can see them and you know they can't see you and it just gives you this little bit of a charge like, oh wow, I can see something that can't see me in return. That happens in front of these pictures. Another thing to point out about this is because they don't look back at you and you have no fear of them looking back at you, it sets up a relationship you don't get in everyday life. I get to look at this beautiful kind of almost goddess lying in the beauty of nature, completely nude, without worrying about her looking back at me. I can be anyone. I mean, she's never going to wake up and say, not you, you're nowhere near my league, right? It sets me up in a powerful position. And the reason it's powerful is it turns that female into an object. It turns her into something that again, doesn't have any personality, doesn't have any feelings or thoughts of their own. It doesn't even allow us to project that onto her. Or at least that's the way we tend to think about this, right? When someone says, oh, men are objectifying women, what they're meaning to say is something like, that man is treating me just according to what his desires for me are. He doesn't think of me as a human being with my own desires. Right? He's turning me into an object. And these types of paintings more recently, let's say in the last 50 years or so, have been called out 
for objectifying women, right? That they set up this relationship in which women's beauty, women's physical allure, their desirability to men is paramount. And that's the only thing it's focused on and only the male's desire matters in these scenes. When he painted this in France, he submitted it to the French Royal Academy's exhibitions, their salon, and it won a prize. So he's very proud of this. He brought it back to the United States and he tried to show it in exhibitions. But again, as you might imagine, the American public who didn't have the long tradition of the female nude or male nudes didn't really understand the cover story of this, the way that these things were supposed to be manifestations of beauty, of idealism. And so when they saw it, they just thought, oh, this is all full of sexuality and we don't want that. This is, you know, something that is European and corrupt and, and you know, filled with vile associations of sensuality. And what I want to say is it's kind of somewhere in between. It's an interesting phenomena where in Europe they were so used to these stories that authorize the objectification of women's bodies into objects of desire that they missed the point that these were about eroticism and desire. And when it showed up in the United States and they didn't have that long tradition of the female nude, they immediately saw that these things had sexual innuendo and they didn't accept it. So what did John Vanderlyn do? Uh, he tried to do the same type of thing that Samuel Morse did with the Gallery of the Louvre. He tried to introduce the American public to scenes that they couldn't visit to see or go to see because they didn't have enough money. These are the uh, palaces and gardens at Versailles. Um, it's actually a panorama. He set up these paintings in a big circular panorama that you could pay to enter and virtually experience the beautiful gardens and palaces of Versailles. He thought, well, you know, if I just culture the American public, eventually they'll get on board with classical ideas and my paintings will sell. There's a close up above the panorama on the bottom. Where he did gain a great deal of success, and we're going to save this uh, for the lecture that is on the representation of Native Americans for the next module is in his picture here called The Death of Jane McRae or sometimes called The Murder of Jane McRae. But we'll come back to this in that later lecture. The final artist that I want to talk to you about today is Hiram Powers. Uh, Hiram Powers, uh, again, just like um, other sculptors, left the Americas to, to learn how to sculpt in, uh, in primarily um, Rome. That was the center of sculpture activity. So he went to Rome. And by the way, there were uh, also English um, uh, sculptors in Rome at the time. He learned the trade. What you're looking at here is one of his plaster casts of Thomas Jefferson. In this case, he he tried his hand at creating full size sculptures of great American leaders like Thomas Jefferson. Or in this case, um, Benjamin Franklin. In this case, you're looking at an actual marble sculpture of Benjamin Franklin. Let me just go back to Thomas Jefferson. If you look at this up close and you see all of these little dots on it, these are little basically data points that you put on a uh, plaster sculpture that is an additive process. So in plaster, you add plaster to create this form, then you sculpt it. And then when it dries, you use these data points to transfer um, or to recreate the same sculpture using calipers in marble. So you start with plaster, then you turn it into marble like this. And he tried his hand at this and he had limited success. Where he found his greatest success, and again, this is the female nude that I want to talk to you about, is with this work. This is called The Greek Slave from 1843. Now, the subject of this, um, I mean, when you first look at this, I think a lot of students are like, what the hell is going on here, right? We've got a nude woman. She's chained up. It seems super weird. But when you actually saw this in person, he made a big point to explain what you're looking at. And this is the first accepted full-scale female nude sculpture, or female nude, frankly, in the United States. People flocked to see this. People bought many, many copies of this. There are at least 12 full-scale copies of this, which is huge. 
and over 200 miniatures because as this pamphlet or this poster explains off on the right hand side what we are looking at is as he says the subject is a grecian maiden made captive by the turks and exposed for sale in a bazaar in constantinople at this time the greeks were in battle to expel the ottoman turks from the greek mainland and the islands it's called the greek wars of independence of course most of western europe sided with greece because greece was the the foundation of western culture right it's the starting point for classical aesthetics and classical ideas classical philosophy it's also for the united states very important because it's the birthplace of democracy and we were the first great democracy so a lot of people had sympathies with the greeks who were trying to expel the Turks, who, by the way, I should have added this, the Greeks were also primarily Orthodox Christian at this time. The Turks were associated with Islam, uh, mo mainly Muslim, uh, and uh, they were doing some pretty horrible things as well. So what we're being told here is a different narrative uh, than the traditional story of um, that we find or the traditional kind of cover story that is a part of classical representations of female nudes. It's still there, right? The idealized human form is a manifestation of the divine. But on top of that, we have something that Americans can understand. This is the enslavement of a woman by those heathen Ottoman Turks and sold off in a bazaar in Constantinople to sexual slavery. We, of course, aren't going to tolerate this. We don't like this. We understand that what's being represented here is bad and that subject is appropriate. We like that. We also, in the United States, associated many uh, of the American public this sculpture with the abolitionist movement. There's a lot, of course, this is basically finished not long before the Civil War. All the way through the early 1800s, there are lots of conversations about whether slavery was appropriate, how we were going to get rid of it, and so on and so forth. Huge abolitionist movements saw this sculpture as uh, at least implicitly embracing their idea that slavery was bad. But along with that, of course, it gives you the erotic charge of seeing a nude woman passively displayed an object that you can look at and even fantasize buying, uh, which is one of the reasons it was so popular, of course. It gives you a criticism of the very pleasure that it allows. And we call this mechanism, this, again, on the surface it says, this is this really, really bad. Don't treat women as objects. Don't treat women as slaves for your sexual pleasure. Don't be the Ottoman Turks. But on the other hand, it shows a beautiful woman's body that appeals to us as well. We call this a double articulation. Two things being said at once. Don't do this thing. This thing that you're not supposed to do, I'm going to give you the pleasure of that as well. And why do I say that? Well, again, there are 12 full-scale copies over... 200 small scale copies. Look at her here for a moment. She's standing. Um, this thing that she has her hand on is a uh, what they would have called at the time an oriental rug. It's actually a strut that helps hold up a marble sculpture. She's got her hands chained together. But imagine that this is a real woman standing on an auction block who's just been taken into slavery and is now being sold to people bidding on who can buy her to be a sexual slave. How many people think this is how you would actually pose? No, what it's doing is it's adopting a pose that was used in Greek sculpture called the Venus Pudica. You don't need to remember that. The modest Venus covering herself kind of, but also leaving herself open to us looking at that beautiful body. Further, you should know that this sculpture, when it was shown in public in the United States, you couldn't see it uh, in mixed company. Men saw it at one time, women and children another time. Uh, when it was shown at the Crystal Palace exhibition in England, uh, it was covered, the back side of it was covered because it was seen as too sensual. 
right? And here what you're looking at is actually a stereoscopic image of this figure from the back to show you that tushy here. Um, stereoscopes, which are those things that show you an image shot from two slightly different angles uh, that then are rectified when you wear a stereoscope and look at that image so that it looks even more 3D, uh, were oftentimes used to show the earliest of erotic imagery. So what you're basically getting here is a kind of pornographic image of her butt. In any case, that's an introduction to the idea of classical aesthetics being attempted to be introduced in the United States with fits and starts, primarily for the purpose of building an idea of nationhood by showing key scenes from the founding of the United States or key important people. I hope you've had fun with this. Uh, next lecture is going to be on the representation of American Indians or, or Native Americans, as well as some representations by Native Americans themselves.